So a lot of people are skeptical about notions like truth and rationality and even knowledge uh, nowadays. It might be helpful to sort of say why people are skeptical about these things. Um, I think one reason that uh, there's a lot of skepticism about these ideas is that it's really difficult to know what's true and to know what's reasonable. Uh, and it, it's, it's, that's a sort of painfully ironic fact right now because we're living in a time where there's so much more information available and to some extent so much more knowledge. It's just because of the devices that we carry around in our pockets. We seem to be able to know so much more. And yet, ironically, it seems as if we disagree even more than ever over what it is we do know. And that sort of polarization, which I, what I call knowledge polarization, really causes a lot of people to be cynical about things like truth. They come to think of appeals to truth as really just veiled appeals to political values. And I think that's a mistake. That's a really crucial mistake for democracy. And, and um, I think the most fundamental reason for that is because we really can't hold to our democratic ideals of treating people with equal respect if, uh, if we don't also have a sense of uh, that um, uh, that view, at least, has the potential for being true. And moreover, I think that critical dissent and crucial other cru crucial notions like that in a democracy are really difficult to understand without appealing to things like rationality and truth. But you ask, uh, you, you ask me uh, uh, what truth and reason are, and that's a long conversation. But I think basically to talk about what's true, as I understand it, is just to talk about um, uh, views or ideas or opinions that reflect things as they are, and not just as we hope or desire or wish them to be. Um, and to talk about rationality is to talk about considerations that we can give um, for our opinions that, that help to make other people and, and, and actually are more likely to be true. So to talk about a reason is to talk about a reason for that is something that makes a claim true. Uh, and I think it's an appeal to things like that, an appeal to facts, as we sometimes put it, that uh, is painfully lacking in contemporary democracy. Reason. Well, probably would be helpful to, well, why don't we start by thinking about what at least I mean by intellectual humility. So in, in my view, to talk about intellectual humility is to talk about the willingness to regard your worldview as open to improvement by the evidence and experience of other people. That is, a willingness to see yourself as open to improvement from evidence and experience from others. So that's a long definition and it has a little a couple parts, but I, it hopefully has some things that will resonate with folks because the idea, well, let's think about it on the, from the opposite end. Think about somebody who doesn't have that. Think about somebody, for perhaps a world leader on the stage right now, who is unwilling to say that uh, they can be improved because they're the greatest already, they're the smartest, they have the best words. And uh, that sort of person, I don't know who I could be talking about, that sort of person portrays a type of intellectual arrogance, uh, which is not limited to that particular world figure, but actually uh, is, 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 if we're honest with each other, is a temptation we all fall into. The idea that somehow we know it all, that we are certain uh, about this particular thing, and there's nothing that the person on the other side of the political or ideological or religious spectrum can ever teach us about that matter. That's intellectual arrogance, and its opposite is what I mean by intellectual uh, humility. And it's connected with truth and reason because clearly to be open to seeing yourself as improving with regard to evidence suggests that you're improving epistemically, that is, with regard to your knowledge. That is, you don't know everything. You don't know all the truth. And I, I think one thing that's uh, earlier I defined truth as, as a true idea as something that reflects the world as it is and not just as we would like it to be. Well, there's a connection between that notion of truth and what I'm calling intellectual humility. Because to be intellectually humble is to understand that the truth may outstrip your grasp of it. It's to basically concede that there's a sense of objectivity in the world that uh, is not, it is not the case that, you know, that man is the measure of all things.
I think the honest answer to this is that we don't know yet. Uh, part of this research project that I'm directing, Humility and Conviction in Public Life at the University of Connecticut, is aimed at trying to discover that the answers to that project. We are of, uh, 10 different projects or working groups around the world that are right now trying to figure out whether um, measuring intellectual humility, uh, engaging in interventions, political and otherwise, that are meant to induce it in people, whether those things can have a measurable impact on polarized communities. So uh, I can't say for certain that that's the case. I can't express my hope that that is the case. Um, and I can also, as a philosopher, um, suggest ways in which that may turn out to be true. I think one thing that the, the con contribution that intellectual humility is going to have, if it does have, uh, to public discourse is really going to be um, at two levels. One is at the individual level. That is, it's certainly we need to find ways, perhaps through education, perhaps through other interventions, to get individual citizens to be more willing to listen to one another. Democracies don't uh, function if citizens don't have conviction, but they also don't function if they don't listen to one another. And so we really need to, to work on that uh, individual level of trying to get people to have and manifest this attitude. But just as importantly, we need to also realize that changing attitudes doesn't just happen on a person-after-person -person basis. And it's not the, the quickest way to change attitudes is to go around and try to be, convince each because there's a lot of people. And um, it just uh, we also know that often doesn't tend to work either uh, effectively or quickly. We also have to work on a social level. And we need to understand that certain social practices and institutions can embody attitudes. They can embody attitudes uh, like uh, uh, integrity or honesty, or they can also embody attitudes of arrogance or contempt. And what I think we, we need to understand is that some of the social practices that are most under threat in certain uh, uh, areas of the world, including in my own country right now, are the practices that embody or can embody the attitude of, uh, of intellectual humility, which is by, by that, I mean they embody them by adopting that attitude as a sort of regulative norm, as a, as a way of, you know, people who participate in these practices, and I'll give an example in a minute, are aiming at, whether they know it or not, <laughs> in, in being responsive to the evidence and learning from the, uh, the experience of others. And so examples like this are the sorts of social practices that we find in science, but also in historical inquiry. Uh, in journalism, as it's traditionally practiced, the idea of having multiple sources. Why do we have, why do we have uh, practices like that? Why do journalists do that? Well, in part because they realize that they're not perfect beings that they get things wrong and that their sources get things wrong. That's why the same thing in law courts. We have ways of trying to collaborate witnesses that we don't just take, usually it's not ideal just to have one person say, well, this person did something because people can get things wrong, they can be distorted, they can be biased, they can be motivated by uh, all sorts of other things. So, and for the same reason, I mean, to take a different example, think about why pilots have checklists. Pilots have checklists because they know that there could be mistakes, and in, when you're a pilot and you forget step three, that can be a bad thing. So what those checklists are meant to actually get that. It's a social practice that embodies intellectual humility because it, it states from the get-go that we want you to be able to, to learn and uh, realize your own limitations. And then when things do go wrong, the idea is to sort of like go back to the checklist and see, well, was, was it followed? Well, in a way, we need to think of our social practices like uh, scientific or historical, journalistic inquiry, legal inquiry, these sorts of standards that we use as sort of like check checklists, checklists for the republic. So what does the humanities and the philosophy have to do with this sort of project? Everything. Everything. Because in my view, the attitude of intellectual or epistemic humility that I've been describing is an attitude that is sunk into the bones of humanistic inquiry. It's a humanistic attitude. It's the sort of attitude that we ideally uh, find ourselves in 
when we encounter history. What is, one of the things that history teaches us is that we know very little less than we thought. We know very less about history, but we also know less about ourselves. And, 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 and constantly, even the methods of history, historical research, constantly showing the limitations of your own biases, reading, finding yourself, catching yourself, reading in the, the presentist ideals, your own current re- understandings of concepts into the past. Avoiding that is a key lesson that historians are constantly trying to teach us. Take the past for what it is, right? And the same thing with literature we might think in poetry, where in those cases we are, we are encountering works of art. Of course, we, we, we learn many different things. But learn the very process of learning those types of things, whatever they are, the idea of this attitude of learning, this attitude of realizing that you might improve by your encounter with a work of art, is an attitude of the humanistic, is a humanistic attitude, and it's an attitude that is partly embodying, uh, I think, in its ideal, this notion of intellectual humility. I think, concretely, um, people need to make sure that they read widely and immerse themselves in culture beyond their discipline. That's, that's clearly important. If you want to speak to people uh, beyond your discipline, you need to learn, learn a little bit about things outside of your discipline and learn that your ways of uh, carving up ideas isn't the only, that, that's not the only way to do things. Um, Another thing is to stay focused on the sort of issues that matter. I think sometimes what happens is that people realize, oh, look, I'm really excited about this particular topic, but they forget that in order to get other people excited into it, just you need to actually find a path from where they are uh, to, to where you are. And um, I think sometimes that path is, is, is less complicated than it might think. It has to do with paying attention to what we might call the primary questions. Uh, the questions that people motivate people to be interested and in, in look to philosophers and intellectuals in the first place. Uh, questions like we've been talking about now. Um, I also think that it's important to obviously realize that there are different types of writing. And it's, it's, um, uh, it's important to try to, uh, to write in a way that uh, conveys one's passion and, and, and is not hes- you're not hesitating in what you have to say. As academics, we are rightly uh, trained to, um, to, to make tentative conclusions, and that's right. Uh, but often in a shorter venue where you have less time, people are, they want, they're reading you because they want to know what you have to say. And I, I mean, if you're, Sometimes I think intellectuals have a way of disparaging that, but actually, if you're honest with yourself, I mean, when I pick up a historian or a scientist and I'm reading something that they've written for the non-specialist, um, I expect to be treated uh, in, as a fellow intelligent person, and I don't want to be talked down to or lectured to. On the other hand, I also want to uh, feel like um, they have something that they're really trying to say that, that is warrants my plunking down my money and buying their book or opening the newspaper or turning on the television to listen to them. So I think that's a complicated answer to a really long practical question, but hopefully that might help.